Good morning. Well, that one again. Good morning. A few announcements as we begin. You can put your offering in the offering box by the sound booth or evening worship service tonight as we interact with God's Word, discussing misreading Scripture with Western eyes. Wednesday night, Bible study and prayer. I encourage you to attend. Prayer is very, very vital for the local church, for families, for individuals. As we reflect on worship, a question, where does genuine worship begin and continue? Answer, God. Revelation 4, 8b, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty, who was and is and is to come. Revelation 4 and verse 11, you're worthy, our Lord and God, to receive glory and honor and power. For you created all things, and by your will they were created and have their being. It also begins with Christ, Revelation 4, or 5, I'm sorry, 9 and 10. You're worthy to take the scroll and to open its seals, because you were slain, and with your blood you were purchased. You purchased men for God from every tribe, language, people, and nation. You made them to be a kingdom and priests to serve our God, and they will reign on the earth. Worship involves God and Christ. Revelation 5.13, to him who sits on the throne and to the Lamb be praise and honor and glory and power forever and ever. Worship is about God, about Christ, not our desires, likes or dislikes. The greater our appreciation and apprehension of the majestic God in Christ whom we worship, the greater our reverence. Reflecting in God and who he is, we want to sing together, holy, holy, holy. chapter of scripture without any comment, reading Ecclesiastes chapter 7 this morning as Danny comes to read for us. Danny. Ecclesiastes chapter 7. 
A good name is better than fine perfume, and the day of death better than the day of birth. It is better to go to a house of mourning than to go to a house of feasting. For death is the destiny of everyone. The living should take this to heart. Frustration is better than laughter, because a sad face is good for the heart. The heart of the wise is in the house of mourning, but the heart of fools is in the house of pleasure. It is better to heed the rebuke of a wise person than to listen to the songs of fools. Like the crackling of thorns under the pot, so is the laughter of fools. This too is meaningless. Extortion turns wise people into fools, and a bribe corrupts the heart. The end of a matter is better than its beginning, and patience is better than pride. Do not be quickly provoked in your spirit, for anger resides in the lap of fools. Do not say, why were the old days better than these? For it is not wise to ask such a question. Wisdom like an inheritance is a good thing and benefits those who see the sun. Wisdom is a shelter as money is a shelter. But the advantage of knowledge is this. Wisdom preserves those who have it. Consider what God has done. Who can straighten what he has made crooked? When times are good, be happy. But when times are bad, consider this. God has made the one as well as the other. Therefore, no one can discover anything about their future. In this meaningless life of mine, I have seen both of these, the righteous perishing in their righteousness and the wicked living long in their wickedness. Do not be over-righteous, neither be over-wise. Why destroy yourself? Do not be over-wicked and do not be a fool. Why die before your time? It is good to grasp the one and not let go of the other. Whoever fears God will avoid all extremes. Wisdom makes one wise person more powerful than ten rulers in a city. Indeed, there is no one on earth who is righteous, no one who does what is right and never sins. Do not pay attention to every word people say, or you may hear your servant cursing you, for you know it in their heart. That many times you yourself have cursed others. All this I tested by wisdom, and I said, I am determined to be wise, but this was beyond me. Whatever ex- exit is far off and most profound, who can discover it? So I turned my mind to understand, to investigate and search out wisdom and the scheme of things, and to understand the stupidity of wickedness and the madness of folly. I find more bitter than death the woman is a, who is a snare, whose heart is a trap, and whose hands are chains. The man who pleases God will escape her, but the sinner will she will ensnare. Look, says the teacher, this is what I have discovered. Adding one thing to another to discover the schemes of things while I was still searching, but not finding. I found one upright man among a thousand, but not one upright woman among all them all. This only have I found. God created mankind upright, but they have gone in search of many schemes. Thank you, Danny. Singing our hymn of the month, I ask the Lord that I might grow. And again, maybe more verses than we might be normal or used to, but a uh, very strong message. <clears throat>
light of the message of that song, there's an insert, you know, with a song listed. Take that sometime and sing it or read through it and change it from the singular to the plural. Thinking about a local body of believers or even your family and how God works in us. We're going to pray together. I will begin praying for a number of items, followed by Arden praying for Dave and Doris Topman. Let's pray together. Father, we acknowledge you as creator and sovereign in our world, our nation, our church, and our lives. Events are all under your will, your purpose, and your control. As we look at history, we see you working out your purpose for your glory. This is obvious in your work in Abraham's life, the nation of Israel in history, the Babylonian Empire, the Assyrian Empire, the Grecian Empire, and the Roman Empire. World events today and national events today are under your sovereign will. In light of events in our own country this past week, Father, we recognize we can't control or change items, but we are accountable for how we respond. Education and political leaders cannot change human nature or control sin and rebellion. We recognize, Father, we're responsible to think and speak in a manner that will bring glory to you. We choose to trust you, to think or to think thoughts that are true, noble, right, pure, lovely, and admirable. We choose to limit our intake of events since we can do nothing about most of them. We desire to be quick to listen, slow to speak, and slow to become angry in our responses to events in our nation. We turn from judgmental thoughts and words that would and turn to those words that would build those who listen and hear. We desire to mind our own business. Much of what takes place in our nation we are not called to act upon. So we have no need to gather information and comment time after time. We want to walk worthy of our calling, being humble, gentle, patient, bearing with one another, and seeking to maintain the unity of the Spirit. In light of our desires, Father, we confess among us as believers in the body of Christ that much bitterness, anger, worry, and frustration are present. This has resulted in cutting words, division in families, believers attacking one another. We air our opinions without sufficient thought to their impact on the hearer. Our words, whether written or verbal, impact for building or harm. We repent and turn to being doers of your word and sensitive to your spirit and our life in Christ. Father, I pray too for individuals that are going through struggles and trials and hardship. Some individuals facing financial struggles for various reasons, some family struggles, and some individuals, Rose Sorber, Marty and Priscilla Martin, and Lorraine Austin, who's in the hospital. In light of struggles, we look to use your shepherd, or as our shepherd, knowing that you want to minister to us. We choose an attitude of joy because we know that that is your will, so you can build perseverance and character and give hope. You're a wise God, and you want to give wisdom in our trials, as you say in James 2, so we ask for those in trial that you would give wisdom. May they choose to endure because you know that, or we know that that is your will for us so that we can receive the crown of life. And may there be a spirit of wisdom and understanding for those in trial to know you, to experience you. We want to be a body as we have over the years where we express love and concern for those in trials. Pray for those listed in our prayer guide, Gerard and Liz Cope and Stanley Cope. And pray for these individuals that they might know your grace, Lord, and your power. They might have wisdom to live in light of changes in their lives due to the pandemic. In the context of Gerard and Liz, may their marriage picture Christ in the church, with Gerard seeking to lead and love, and Liz following and complimenting in their jobs. 
May they work hard as unto you to please you and wisdom in responding to their family and circumstances that they face. And Stanley, as he has physical limitations due to his stroke, build him up, encourage him. May he be instrumental in mentoring his family and younger people. And pray too for the deacons, Danny, Jason, and Alan, desiring that you'll keep them sensitive to pursuing holiness and godliness from the inside out so that they're transformed from glory to glory. May they know and experience your power at work in them, a power beyond what they can ask or comprehend, and how that looks in daily living in their jobs. Keep them sensitive to working out their salvation with fear and trembling because you are at work in them. As husbands and fathers, may they seek to be an example and say, follow me as I follow Christ to their wife and children. May they have wisdom and leading and guiding and loving in their respective jobs. May they reflect Christ in working, how they respond in the job, how they speak. Wisdom and grace in caring for people's needs in our church, relating to them and ministering deeply to them. And wisdom in caring for the physical structure of our church also. For it's in Christ's name I pray. Arden. Heavenly Father, as we would faithfully continue to pray to you this morning, Lord, we bring David Doris Topman, two of our missionaries, to served for many years in Ghana along the Ivory Coast. Just pray, Lord, for, for them as they, like us sitting here this morning, living in that hard time that we're in and having to make decisions and also they have their their family that's also in a time of trial now with this virus that's attacking the world, Lord. So they ask for prayer from us, Lord, to, for their children, Lord, and the adjustments that they have to make to one son's a missionary he was over in Hungary, but was returned to the United States, and he's trying to readjust in the in the work. I guess just as the stovers do, Lord, can't return back to where they were. Some of their other family members are facing trials, Lord, and just pray for them. We also pray for Dave as he has taken to doing some work on the computer and stuff and writing courses that are sent out and any available to anyone that can, has access to the internet to uh, to challenge people and to help them to study the scriptures put them to the proper use for the for your glory lord and we thank them for that lord we also thank them lord for the times that they that they spent in Ghana, Lord, when we know that it's a hard hard life down there, Lord, and for Pastor and Ruth Ann went down there for a while to serve with them and big change from what we're used to around here, Lord. But they they remained faithful for years. They kept the faith. They did they asked that you supply them, and you did, Lord. Met their needs. Kept them safe, Lord. And we just pray, Lord, for their faithfulness and also for for their ability within their families and stuff to hopefully that we all return to normal soon, Lord, that where we can serve you better, remain faithful to you, and continue to be supportive to individuals like these, Lord, who give it all to you. In your name. Amen.
Thank you, Arden. Singing together, El Shaddai. And if you look that up in your hymnal sometime, and uh, in the bottom they have you know some of the names defined for you. But singing together, El Shaddai. <laughs> going to begin a study of Jonah and Nehemiah. I'm sorry, not Nehemiah, Nahum. (laughs) Jonah and Nahum, they kind of go together. To be familiar with books, we're going to read a portion of each book each week. So this morning, we're going to take our Bibles open to the book of Jonah. And since it's a shorter book, We're going to have some introductory comments this morning. We're going to read through the entire book of Jonah. I invite you to turn there as Alan and Hayden and Scott. Alan reading chapter 1, Hayden chapter 2, Scott chapter 3, and then I'll read chapter 4. And then we'll pick up with our study from there. So if you guys want to all come, just be here on the platform, ready to step up when you're done reading. You can uh, sit down. Alan? Jonah chapter 1. The word of the Lord came to Jonah, son of Aminate. Go to the great city of Nineveh and preach against it, because its wickedness has come up before me. But Jonah ran away from the Lord. He headed for Tarshish. He went down to Joppa, where he found a ship bound for that port. After paying the fare, he went aboard and sailed for Tarshish, to flee from the Lord. Then the Lord sent a great wind on the sea, and such a violent storm arose that the ship threatened to break up. All the sailors were afraid, and each cried out to his own God, and they threw the cargo into the sea to lighten the ship. But Jonah had gone below deck, where he lay down and fell into a deep sleep. The captain went to him and said, How can you sleep? Get up and call on your God. Maybe he will take notice of us, and we will not perish. Then the sailors said to each other, Come, let us cast lots to find out who is responsible for this calamity. They cast lots, and the lot fell on Jonah. So they asked him, Tell us who is responsible for making all this trouble for us. What do you do? Where do you come from? What is your country? From what people are you? He answered, I am a Hebrew, and I worship the Lord, the God of heaven, who made the sea and the land. This terrified them, and they asked, What have you done? They knew he was running away from the Lord, because he had already told them so. The sea was getting rougher and rougher, so they asked him, What should we do to make the sea calm calm down for us? Pick me up and throw me into the sea, he replied, and it will become calm. I know that it is my fault that this great storm has come upon you. Instead, the men did their best to row back to land, but they could not, for the sea even grew wilder than before. Then they cried to the Lord, O Lord, please do not let us die from, for taking this man's life. Do not hold us accountable for killing an innocent man. For you, O Lord, have done as you pleased. Then they took Jonah and threw him overboard. And the raging sea grew calm. At this the men greatly feared the Lord, and they offered a sacrifice to the Lord, and made vows to him. But the Lord provided a great fish to swallow Jonah, and Jonah was inside the fish three days and three nights. From inside the fish, Jonah prayed to the Lord his God. He said, 
In my distress, I called to the Lord, and he answered me. From deep in the realm of the dead, I called for help, and you listened to my cry. You hurled me into the depths, into the very heart of the seas, and the currents swirled about me. All your waves and breakers swept over me. I said, I have been banished from your sight, yet I will look again towards your holy temple. The engulfing waters threatened me. The deep surrounded me. Seaweed was wrapped around my head. To the roots of the mountains I sank down. The earth beneath barred me in forever. But you, Lord my God, brought my life up from the pit. When my life was ebbing away, I remembered you, Lord, and my prayer rose to you, to your holy temple. Those who cling to worthless idols turn away from God's love for them. But I, with shouts of grateful praise, will sacrifice to you. What I have vowed, I will make good. I will say, salvation comes from the Lord. And the Lord commanded the fish, and it vomited Jonah onto dry land. Then the word of the Lord came to Jonah a second time. Go to the great city of Nineveh and proclaim to it the message I give you. Jonah obeyed the Lord, obeyed the word of the Lord, and went to Nineveh. Now Nineveh was a very important city. A visit required three days. On the first day, Jonah started into the city. He proclaimed, Forty more days and Nineveh will be overturned. The Ninevites believed God. They declared a fast, and all of them, from the greatest to the least, put on sackcloth. When the news reached the king of Nineveh, he rose from his throne, took off his royal robes, covered himself with sackcloth, and sat down in the dust. Then he issued a proclamation in Nineveh. By the decree of the king and his nobles, do not let any man or beast, herd or flock, taste anything. Do not let them eat or drink. But let man and beast be covered with sackcloth. Let everyone call urgently on God. Let them give up their evil ways and their violence. Who knows? God may yet relent and with compassion turn from his fierce anger so that they will not perish. When God saw what they did and how they turned from their evil ways, he had compassion and did not bring upon them the destruction he had threatened. But Jonah was greatly displeased and became angry. He prayed to the Lord, O Lord, is this not what I said when I was still at home? That is why that is why I was so quick to flee to Tarshish. I knew that you are a gracious and compassionate God, slow to anger and abounding in love, a God who relents from sending calamity. Now, O Lord, take away my life. For it is better for me to die than to live. But the Lord replied, Have you any reason to be angry? Jonah went out and sat down at a place east of the city. There he made himself a shelter, sat in its shade, and waited to see what would happen to the city. Then the Lord provided a vine and made it grow up over Jonah to give shade to his, for his head and to ease his discomfort. And Jonah was very happy about the vine. But at dawn the next day, God provided a worm, which chewed the vine so that it withered. When the sun rose, God provided a scorching east wind, and the sun blazed on Jonah's head so that he grew faint. He wanted to die and said, It'd be better for me to die than to live. But God said to Jonah, Do you have a right to be angry about the vine? I do, he said. I'm angry enough to die. But the Lord said, You've been concerned about this vine, though you do not tend it and make it grow. It sprang up overnight and died overnight. But Nineveh has more than 120,000 people who cannot tell their right hand from their left, and as many cattle as well. Should I not be concerned about that great city? As we think about the book of Jonah and then Nahum, I want to give you some reason for even listening or considering the book of Jonah. Imagine with me that you are going to purchase, if you're a trucker, 
an 18-wheel truck, 18-wheel tractor and then a trailer. You stop at the first dealer and you see the truck that you would like to purchase. After checking out a variety of items, you think, this just fits the bill perfectly. And then you open the hood, and you see that it has an 18-horsepower engine. So there's something wrong here. Is anyone willing to volunteer? Rachel. Here, and I have a hamburger, cheeseburger, I should say. And I would like you, Rachel, to take a couple bites out of it. Come on over here. Is it no. Why not? It's, it's raw. It's raw. Okay, thank you. You miss it down. <laughs> Anyone who purchases a truck wants to be sure everything is in order so it's going to function properly. If we're going to enjoy a hamburger or a cheeseburger, what do we want? We want it to be prepared properly so it tastes good. And as we look at the book of Jonah and then at Nahum, we'll be tempted to jump into Jonah 1 and verse 1 and say, let's get on with the book. But how how about the preparation of looking to see what's under the hood? We're making sure the hamburger is cooked. When we eat, we like something to be properly prepared. When we purchase, we like to be a good purchase. And as we think about Noah, Noah, Jonah, if I'm getting all mixed up this morning, when we think about Jonah, we want to be concerned about a number of items so that we better understand where the Lord is coming from as he spoke through Jonah, as he spoke through Nahum. I want to consider the history of the nation of Israel. And just a brief time chart of history. And I realize this is very brief, but I trust a couple of things will come out through it. First of all, approximate date, I'm not being dogmatic on the exact year, 2090, we have the call of Abraham. 1895, Joseph possibly sold into slavery. 1875, Jacob and his family go to Egypt. 1445, we find that Israel exited from Egypt. 1043, King Saul was selected. In 930, Israel divided. In 782 to 745, Jonah would have ministered. 722, we have the fall of Israel, that is the ten northern kingdoms. They went into Assyrian captivity. In 612, Nineveh fell. In 606 BC, the first of Judah to the two southern tribes going into into captivity. And I want you to notice that some 1,400 years have passed and Christ has not come on the scene. I trust that through what brief discussion we had with the time chart, that several items stand out like the pain that comes with kidney stones or the pain that comes with childbirth. God did not give history for mere facts. He's communicating something about himself and how he works. First item that I will mention a number of times this morning is that God uses people to accomplish his purpose. He called Abraham. He worked through Joseph. But he used people. People are God's method. Secondly, I want to emphasize that his purpose is over an extended period of time. He was not in a hurry. He was not in a rush or demanding instant results. It seemed like he made deliberate choices to act slowly. 
we see the same two facts coming through loud and clear as we consider a brief overview of the Old Testament prophets. The Hebrew canon can be divided into law, history, poetry, and prophets. Under law, we have Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. History, we have Joshua, Judges, Ruth, 1st and 2nd Samuel, 1st and 2nd Kings, 1st and 2nd Chronicles, Ezra, Nehemiah, and Esther. Under poetry, we have Job, Psalms, Proverbs, Ecclesiastes, Song of Solomon. And then under prophets, we have four major prophets, Isaiah, Jeremiah, and Lamentation, Ezekiel, and Daniel. And then we have the 12, what are commonly called the minor prophets. The order of the prophets as they appear in scripture are not the way they chronologically lived. But I want you again to notice that at least some four to 5,000 years have passed if you take from Genesis through Malachi, but God still is not done. He's still working. He doesn't seem to be in a rush. He doesn't seem to be in a hurry. And what has he done? He has used prophet after prophet. Here we have the writing prophets. We have many prophets that never wrote, that ministered to Israel and Jeremiah again and again. The prophets, in chronological order, we have Joel. And again, the dates, I'm not being dogmatic, exact years, but the time frame, Joel would have ministered from 835 to 795, and he deals with the day of the Lord. And he was addressing the southern kingdom. Jonah would have ministered from 780 to 750. Topic deals with Nineveh and Jonah's disobedience that would have been addressed to the northern kingdom as well as to Nineveh. Then Amos came on the scene, 765 to 750, deals with the sins of the nation. And Amos talks about one nation after another and their sins. And that would have been directed to the northern kingdom. Hosea, 755 to 715, deals with God's love and his holiness, addressed to the northern kingdom. And keep in mind that the northern kingdom did not walk with God. Isaiah, 750 to 680, Strong condemnation of sin, but also consolation. Condemnation? Consolation. Directed to the southern kingdom. Micah, 740 to 690. Hear the word. Hear what the Lord says. Directed to the southern kingdom. Zephaniah, 625 to 610. God's remnant. Again, directed to the southern kingdom. Then we have Nahum, 630 to 610 dealing with the doom of Nineveh. And that's addressed to the southern kingdom. We have Jeremiah and Lamentations, 626 to 586. Judah would have gone into captivity. The two southern tribes, Judah, would have gone into Babylonian captivity during that time period. Jeremiah confronts sin, a lot of tears, but a need for faith. And that would have been directed to the southern kingdom. Habakkuk, 625 to 586, deals with living by faith. And Habakkuk, keep in mind, was looking at the evil in Judah. And he says, Lord, how long can this go on? When the Lord says, well, I'm going to send Babylon. And then he responds with, but Lord, Babylon's much more evil than we are. And then we find that the Lord responds to his second complaint. And then he prays to God in chapter 3. Addressed to the southern kingdom. We find Daniel 606 to 534. Dealing with the times of the Gentile. I'm sorry, I missed Obadiah. Obadiah 586 to, we're not sure. And that deals with Edom's doom. 
And again, addressed to the southern tribes. Then Daniel 606 to 534, the times of the Gentiles, when the Gentiles are going to be taking over and Judah more or less set aside, addressed to the southern kingdom. Ezekiel 593 to 571. And again, Ezekiel takes place when Judah is in captivity. And Ezekiel shares his visions and God's future for the nation. Haggai, 520 to 516, finish into the temple. Some of the Jews returned from Babylonian captivity and they needed some help. Encouragement in terms of the temple being finished. Zechariah, 520 to 500, God's plan for the Jews and God's plan for the remnant. And then Malachi 450 to 400 deals with the sins of the priest. And again, if you look at the dates, we find that some 400 years have passed. And what is God using? God is using people. As you read the flow of Scripture, God works through people. And he also, if you please, takes his time, at least from our perspective. A promise had been made to Adam and Eve. Now the serpent is going to bruise his heel, but the woman's seed will crush him. Years have passed. And the promise still not fulfilled. You know, initially, Adam and Eve may have thought the promise was going to be in Abel. But Abel ended up being killed. Seth comes along. It was going to be in Seth, but Seth died. God is just slowly moving along. God uses people to deliver his message. All the prophets were individuals, not animals or angels or robots. And God chose to have the prophets minister over an extended period of time. I want to reflect briefly on contrasting Jonah and Nahum. Thinking about the two prophets, Jonah the area that we're contrasting, and then Nahum. Jonah would have ministered somewhere 750 B.C. And Nahum would have been after 661 B.C., but before 645 for a number of reasons, as we'll cover in the future. The writer is Jonah. The author is Jonah, writing under inspiration of the Holy Spirit. And then in Nahum, the author is Nahum, again, writing under inspiration of the Holy Spirit. The city or nation that is being addressed in Jonah, we're addressing Assyria or Nineveh, primarily Nineveh. In Nahum, we're addressing, again, Assyria and Nineveh. Where was it spoken? Jonah would have spoken Nineveh and then addressing the four, or I'm sorry, the northern tribes. Whereas Nahum would have been spoken in Judah. Jonah being addressed to the four, nor- or I'm sorry, the ten northern tribes. Judah being addressed to Nineveh. When Jonah was written, Nineveh was in decline. That's very important to understand. It's in their decline that God turns to the Gentiles and we see a city repenting. Whereas Nahum, some 100 years later, we find Nineveh is in power and Nahum predicts their judgment. The theme of Jonah would be salvation for Nineveh. 
a Gentile nation, a nation that is after Israel. And God responds. And it's interesting that Jonah gets pretty upset. Why would he get upset? Because Nineveh, Assyria, was an enemy of Israel. And here they are. I'm supposed to go and preach to them? So God says, Arden, I want you to go to Iran and preach. And then when they repent... Arden says, Lord, I knew you were gracious and compassionate, slow to anger and abounding in love. A God who relents from sending calamity. God, I'm just ready to die. Why? Because the theme of Jonah is the salvation of Nineveh. A hundred years later, we find the theme of Nahum is judgment against Nineveh, a Gentile nation. The result in Jonah, Nineveh is saved spiritually and physically. Talks about them in sackcloth and ashes. The result of Nahum is that Nineveh is destroyed. The purpose, or part of the purpose in Jonah would be to display God's sovereignty in his being gracious and forgiving to Gentiles. The purpose in Nahum being God is sovereign in displaying wrath toward those who rebel, even Gentiles. We see his grace grace and forgiveness, but we also see his wrath directed at the same city. Contribution to theology. Jonah, God is gracious and forgiving. Nahum. God is wrath, and he judges sin. So when you think of Jonah, and you think of Nahum, think of a door. Jonah's one side, Nahum's the other side. You need to see them together to see the character of God, the sovereignty of God, and how he works. And as you think about Jonah and Nahum, we find that The issue of God and God's comes up. God, creator God, but God's. Jonah, as he was on the ship, the sailors said, why don't you cry out to your God? And then we know that, as we'll find, we'll discuss in greater detail, in the city of Nineveh there were gods, false gods. And God confronts them. What two facts stand out very, very strongly in light of what we have discussed so far this morning? First, God chooses prophets, people, to carry his message. And in the context of Jonah, a Jewish prophet going to a Gentile nation, a Gentile city. But he uses people. Secondly, God chose to work in Nineveh, Israel, and Judah. Since all three nations are involved, all Assyria and Nineveh, Israel and Judah, because Judah, Nahum, Israel, Jonah, and then Jonah ministering to Nineveh and the Assyrian kingdom. But he does that over a period of time. He was not in a rush. A flow of scripture, you will find that God works through people. Not limited to that, but a primary method. And his working is generally much slower than what humans want it to be. So in view of those facts, God using people to accomplish his purpose and taking time to accomplish his purpose, 
Let me share some practical applications for living in the 21st century. Accept the fact that Joan and Nahum cannot be understood instantly. It will require some time and learning. And that's the reason we took time to discuss Israel's history, a timeline, an overview of the prophets, and contrasting Jonah and Nahum. To fail to do that is like eating a frozen burger. You need the time to prepare it, to cook it. Or buying an 18-wheeler without checking what's under the hood. God's not in a rush. Our goal should not to be to hurry through study of Scripture, but rather as we take in. We live it out for God's glory. Another application. Choose to present your body to God as a living sacrifice and live in light of that reality each day. God desires to use you, to use me in our families, on the job, with a neighbor, where we are, as he uses Jonah and he used Nahum. Living for God's glory, not to accomplish our goals. Thirdly, accept the fact that God is concerned about people and wants to use people to impact people. God used Jonah to impact Nineveh. God used Jonah to impact the northern kingdom. God used Jonah, or I'm sorry, Nahum to impact Nineveh along with the southern kingdom. Our life should not be centered around merely our job, our money, our sports, our school, but around people. Going to work is a method God uses to impact people for Christ. Spending money is a method God uses to impact a clerk, a salesperson. Visiting the doctor is an opportunity to impact a nurse or the doctor. Involvement in sports is a method God can use to, for you to impact other players and a coach. Attending school If you're online now, that's different. But when you get back to school, the method God uses to impact teachers and other students. A fourth application in light of our discussion this morning. Reject the lie that things must be instant. And accept the truth that God works slow and deliberately from a human point of view. I personally have had my share of conversations with God about his slowness. He always wins. In the sense that I say, okay, God. Jonah was not happy in the sense that he had to go to Nineveh. He fled, went the opposite direction. He ends up in Nineveh. And then he whines and complains because he thinks God is going to save Nineveh, which he does. God works slow and deliberate. Judgment did not come on Nineveh till a hundred years later. Choose to get off the instant mentality train and on to it takes time wagon. As we think about instant, genuine spiritual growth takes time, like growing a hardwood tree. Understanding God's word takes some time and thinking and pondering. Moving children to adult, godly adults takes time, like building a castle years ago. Reaching people with the gospel requires preparation of soil. Planting of the seed, cultivation of the soil. Genuine change in patterns of life. Take time. Limit the demands you place in yourself 
as to what must be done so that you have time to ponder and to think. Being too busy will destroy our effectiveness for the Lord. There is no time to simply communicate with God. Hurry, hurry, people and instant people tend not to have a depth of character. You ever think about Jonah? He's going to go to Nineveh. How's he going to get there? Not going to get in a plane. We'll be going to walk. Day after day, trudging across the desert, thinking and pondering. But before he gets to that point, he flees. And he's on a ship. It still amazes me that he could sleep during the storm, but he did. But just the time to think and to ponder. We need sometimes slowness of life. To hear God. America will not change overnight. We got to where we are over an extended period of time. The events of this past week have been years of history behind them. That involves people and God's sovereign timing. We rest in God's grace and sovereignty. I repeat. America will not change overnight. We got to where we are over an extended period of time. The events of this past week have been years of history behind them that involves people and God's sovereign timing. We rest in God's grace and sovereignty. And in terms of slow and deliberate living, be committed to godliness for God. And for his glory in the long term. Don't rush the pandemic. Experience God in the midst of it. So that when we come out of it, we can look back and say, I walk with God. So I know how to walk with him in the present. Let's not rush God. Jonah didn't want to go he fled but God worked through Jonah a city repented but a hundred years later through Nahum God again worked and Nineveh was judged but all over time Let's pray together. Father, it's easy to go to your word and read what scripture says. But as we understand some of the background and how you think and how you work, it brings your word to life in a much deeper and fuller way. We thank you for working down through the pages of history from Adam down through Jonah, Nahum, Christ, and continuing to work in the present time. We know, Father, that in your process of working, many times you're much slower than we would be. May we grasp that that's who you are. And as you work according to your timetable, may we grasp, too, that you use people. You pursued people. You pursued Jonah. You pursued Nineveh. You pursued Nahum. You pursued Judah. You pursued the ten northern tribes, Israel. And today you're in the business of pursuing people. May we live in light of the fact that you want to use us to pursue others because you have pursued us. May we live in a deep sensitivity to you, Father. 
because we're concerned about your glory. For it's in Christ's name I pray. Amen. You're dismissed.